In this video, I'm going to talk about visual storytelling and some particular devices and techniques that you need to know if you're working with visuals in your stories. In short, I'm going to talk about um, some of the older visual techniques, particularly around images and visual composition. I'm going to talk about new visual languages, the, the use of GIFs and emojis and memes in storytelling. And I'm going to talk about how increasingly we're taking things that are not inherently visual, like audio and text, and turning them visual because of web and multimodal presentation. So let's start with the basics and images. Now, increasingly because we're having to use images and we're working you know, on visual platforms like Instagram, it's important to understand some of the basic concepts in visual storytelling and the use of images. One of the most fundamental techniques is the idea of the rule of thirds and the way that you compose an image. This idea basically focuses on splitting the area of the screen or the area of the image into thirds using lines and the point of focus of your story should be positioned where those lines intersect. In these three examples you can see how the man's eyes and the bird's eyes are both positioned at that intersection and in the more scenic image the prow of the boat and indeed the uh, island in the background are both positioned on those intersections creating movement across the frame. These principles apply in vertical and square photography just as much as they do in horizontal photography. So these two images are taken from Snapchat stories, they're, they're from videos and this is another point about composition. You must obviously compose your image for video just as you do for still images. On the image on the right you can see that the subject of the um, story the woman with the sunglasses is positioned very well. The composition is very good. It's nice and tightly framed as well. And the eye knows exactly where to go to see where the story is in this picture. The image on the right, however, um, is much more poorly composed. The actual mouth of the man speaking to camera is positioned at that intersection. And so your eye is drawn to that rather than to his eyes. So make sure that you're considering these ideas, the rule of thirds when you're using images, whatever ratio you might be using. And you can find out how to turn this on on your camera as well so you can see when you're using it on your mobile phone. It's worth pointing out that some of these rules uh, can obviously be broken and often are. For example, we increasingly now see the um, visual grammar of television changing to position the subject of the story in the centre of the screen. Um, this can be used for various effects and also increasingly that, that they are used um, staring directly down the lens rather than off camera. This can create a sense of intimacy and it's fair to argue probably that, that YouTubers have helped popularise this style and online video has, has helped introduce this style into online video and now broadcast video as well. So you can consider alternative ways of framing the subject and at the end of this video I'll give you some resources to look at which cover that in more detail. For now though I want to move on from photography and video composition into the new visual languages that we need to be familiar with as modern storytellers. Instagram for example, um, one thing that we increasingly know about Instagram is what people react to um, positively. We have more information about how people engage with images. A report by the BBC in 2019, for example, found that audiences tended to respond more to emotive faces, um, stories that tell part of a story or images that tell part of a story. Provocative images or gri gripping images, those that surprise or shock, can draw in audiences as well and uh, probably a, a symptom of, of a general trend in terms of online storytelling as well images that convey positivity um, particularly in the face of adversity tend to do quite well on Instagram as well and this is a pattern that we've seen across the web generally this idea of, of feel-good stories 
um, doing quite well. Here are some examples of emojis being used in um, social media. Emojis are part of this visual literacy and what emojis do very effectively is allow you to communicate um, succinctly, uh, not just in terms of a number of characters but in terms of the amount of time that someone might need to interpret a story. And emojis can be used both literally to indicate um, objects, for example, as in the example on the right. So this is a profile of a sporting um, celebrity, if you like, sporting personality. And we have things like a birthday cake used to indicate birthday, a house indicating location, and so on. On the left, the emojis are used more to convey emotion and reaction. So the different reactions of different political parties in this case to their results. Um, reaction and literal treatment emerges when you look at other examples as well. In these mobile alerts on the right, which are another common place where you will find emojis used, we have um, a couple of examples where the emoji is used to illustrate the reaction to a story. So uh, embarrassment, um, anxiety but also used to convey what happened in the story or who was involved. So in the third example on the right, we have a lion used to indicate that there is a lion in the story. And in the last example, we have the crying emoji used to indicate that someone was crying in the story. Likewise, on the left, we can see emojis used as stickers in a Snapchat story. Um, but also, in addition, they've been printed off and used as props by the actual presenters in the story. So this is a case where the virtual imagery of the emoji is also being used physically in an analog world as part of, if you like, the set. Moving on then to GIFs, um, it's worth pointing out that GIFs are another part of the new visual literacy that um, storytellers need to be familiar with. And with GIFs, often what we're talking about is uh, are these concepts of mimesis and diegesis again. In other words, the idea of showing rather than telling. What GIFs can do very effectively is show a reaction or an emotion or something about a story rather than um, trying to use words to tell the audience what happened. Emojis, uh, sorry, uh, GIFs are often about reactions like these, but also they can um, capture a key moment in the event of the story. They're increasingly used within stories alongside text and indeed on home pages as well. You might see them on social in particular. Um, this is a good example where a particular clip has been taken from a video package that's going to be on TV that evening and they've taken that clip and turned it into a GIF for social. And that's certainly one technique that's worth considering, taking an extract from a video and using it as the GIF to illustrate the social update about your story. You can do this using tools like the um, YouTube to GIF maker on free GIF maker on that address in the bottom left. But if you just Google any sort of YouTube to GIF tool, you'll find lots of other examples as well. Another option is to make a GIF set. This is something you'll see on Tumblr which is a number of different GIFs combined together and you'll find a tutorial on how to do this in the um, slides on Moodle. Broadly speaking with GIFs there are probably five different ways that you can create them at least. The first is to reuse an existing GIF so I'll use a search engine like Giphy that's dedicated to GIFs and find a GIF that represents the emotion or the event um, or the idea that you want to associate with your story. Alternatively, as we've already mentioned, you can take a video clip that you've made and create a GIF from it. But you can also take um, existing videos that are on YouTube and do the same thing. So there might be a particular clip from a film trailer or a TV show that happens to be on YouTube that you can grab a clip from and turn into a GIF. You can also create GIFs from image sequences. So if you have a series of photos, then you can um, upload those to a GIF making service, a GIF making tool, and turn that series of photos into a GIF. 
And you can use the same process with non-photographic images like graphics or charts or even text as images. You can use screen capture to capture what's happening on your screen on your computer and turn that into a GIF as well. And you can take existing GIFs and create memes from those by superimposing new text on top of the existing GIF. There are tools like Cheeseburger that will allow you to do that. And GIFs tend to be widely used um, in social updates as we've seen and in stories, but also listicles often tend to use GIFs and email newsletters as well. Let's move on then to uh, memes and it's worth making a distinction here between the word meme as it's used generally and actually what we often mean by meme. So when we talk about memes what we really normally are talking about is an internet meme that is a particular idea presented as an image or a certain phrase something that's that's shared around um, on social media for example. The word meme more generally actually refers to any sort of idea or behaviour that's passed from one person to another. So for example the idea of fast fashion is a meme, it's a concept. Um, even the idea of global warming is a meme. Um, fashions are memes as well. So that's a more general concept. Really what we're concerned with is the idea of internet memes. Here's one example. And it's worth drawing attention here to the particular generic qualities of a meme. Memes are a genre just like any other. And um, we can tell when something is a genre because if something violates the rules of that genre, it feels um, not quite right or perhaps unprofessional, even if memes themselves might not be a professional form. So a couple of questions that are worth asking here. First of all, if you look at that meme, that image, try to identify what is it that makes it a meme? What qualities does it have that make it a meme? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that or you can pause the video and spend some time looking at it. Okay, so hopefully you've done that. Um, let me tell you some things that stand out to me. First of all, we've got the font of the text. Um, the font in this question is impact, and impact is widely used in memes. It, um, as we'll see later on, um, it tends to be much more effective. It tends to be associated with this meme form. Likewise, the fact that it's white with a black outline is also something that is common to the genre. So if you're going to create a meme, it's worth using these generic conventions. We also have this text in two parts, one above the image and the second part uh, at the bottom part of the image. And this is not only a generic quality, but it's also um, a narrative structure as well. We have a beginning and an end, and the picture to some extent acts as a middle in this story. So what we have in very simple terms is a, an, an introduction, we investigated ourselves, and then a twist and cleared ourselves of any wrongdoing. So being able to look at a, a piece of media, a meme in this way, helps you to understand what are the rules of this genre and how can I replicate those rules if I'm going to create a meme myself. I need to follow the rules of the form and I also need to think about the structure, have, have an introduction, and a twist. Now, memes um, are quite useful in a range of contexts. For example, they've been used in fact checking because memes are used to create hoaxes as well. So it's, it's a way of using the same language as the, um, the myths that you're trying to bust. They've also been used quite successfully to um, create interaction with audiences and stimulate contributions from the community, the audience that you're aiming at. In this particular example, um, a, a group of people wanted to look at pollution in Beijing and they got the audience to post their own memes and selfies and GIFs as part of the discussion around that. So it's well worth considering, particularly as memes are, are a, a, if you like, a public language, um, something that a lot of people that they can take part in 
and indeed they are culturally generated. Uh, this is one of the strengths of memes as a visual language. Now, one of the other things about memes is they are essentially a form of intertextuality. The images that are used in a meme have acquired some sort of cultural meaning through repetition and use. So you've probably seen a meme featuring this uh, particular kid, uh, the kid that's known as Success Kid, or sometimes I Hate Sandcastles, and um, this person has been so frequently used that he has his own particular meanings associated with him. This image on the right is a good, good example of this. It's um, an image of a man looking at one woman while holding the hand of another, and it's often used to illustrate stories about some sort of conflict or inner conflict. In this particular example, it's being used to illustrate the story of a staged um, murder, a fake murder, and the, the conflict that that represented for the person involved. Now notice the contrast between that and a second example with the same image being used to tell the story of the UK's um, cock-up over Test and Trace, where an Excel spreadsheet was um, at fault for missing 16,000 cases. So in this case, the conflict is between using Excel, which is easy but um, not appropriate, and using an actual database, which is harder, but actually what you should be doing. Now, in this example, they've not used that impact font. So if you like, this example is much more effective because it follows the rules of the genre, whereas this example, in not following those rules, misses the mark slightly. Moving on from memes, it's worth pointing out that this drive to make the non-visual visual can be done in a number of ways. Uh, taking quotes, taking lists and turning them into images is one useful technique to consider. This makes your stories easier to share on social or to tell on social because even if you're limited by the number of words or characters that you can count on a platform like Twitter, the image gets around that limitation. Quotes in particular work very well with this. And numbers as well, big numbers, key facts can be used effectively as well. This is the BBC's Go Figure project, which was entirely social native, used an image with a number every day to tell a particular story. Illustration has also found a new lease of life because of this increasingly visual language that we are using. Um, so it may be worth considering working with an illustrator or indeed if you are able to illustrate yourself, consider using that as part of your storytelling. And audio has found a new lease of life, a new visual lease of life as a result of some of these techniques. Um, this particular series, Blank on Blank, takes audio tapes of lost interviews with famous people and um, updates them for a YouTube era, if you like, by adding illustration and animation to turn that audio into video. There are a number of tools to create all of these visuals. Um, Canva in particular is very useful for creating images for social. Um, one of the advantages of Canva is it will create the image in the appropriate dimensions for the target um, platform. It will e even allow you to create carousels for Instagram, for example. Now, Canva is, is good for turning quotes into images and links into images. Uh, Cheeseburger is useful for creating GIFs and memes, and Giphy is useful for creating GIFs. You can use a tool like Unfold to create uh, stories for Instagram and Snapchat. And there's a whole video, again in the slides, about creating social media graphics in general. So just to sum up some of the key points from this video. First of all, we have those basic fundamental uh, concepts of composition to improve your images and the storytelling that you are doing through those images. Remember this applies to vertical images, square images and new platforms like Instagram and Snapchat and Pinterest. Beyond that, we have a new visual language to learn with GIFs and emojis and memes. Make sure that you're engaging with that new language and that you're confident in using 
Force tools, it will take experimentation and exploration of good examples. And finally, seek to make the non-visual visual. Things like audio, things like quotes, things like numbers, things like lists can be made visual and tools like Canva are a really good way to do that. Also in the slides you'll find some playlists and tutorials on composition if you want to know more about those. So in these last two slides you'll find a couple of resources on those as well.